pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, may this message be acceptable in your sight. May it glorify you. May it edify us. May it build up this body of Christ so that we sing your praises. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, Palm Sunday is the day we celebrate Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Now, people were gathering in Jerusalem because it was the festival of Passover. Passover. It was the time to remember God's gracious act of saving His people, of liberating them out of the bondage of slavery. And so people went to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was normally a city of about 50,000 people. But because of the festival of Passover, it swelled to at least 100,000. One ancient historian, Josephus, says it went to 2.5 million people, which to me is a bit of an exaggeration. But nonetheless, it swelled with people. And thus when Jesus came in, there were hundreds, thousands upon thousands of people, and it was like a big parade, right? And on Palm Sunday, well, who doesn't like a big parade? And we normally talk about the parade aspect of Palm Sunday, and we haven't done, we're older, so we don't wave our palm branches, and besides, shoulder surgeries makes it a little harder. But we, we do celebrate it, right? But this year, I want to focus not on his entry, but actually what happened the day after. Because it is uh, something that you probably have all heard about, but I have never covered since I've been here almost six years. And I thought today would be a good day to cover it. It is about the cleansing of the temple. So all four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, speak of Jesus cleansing the temple. Now, in the Gospel of John, it's earlier in his ministry. So there's a first time that he did it. The second time, it's covered by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the reason we're going to focus on it today is because it gets to the heart of worship, of worshiping God Jesus, the triumphant king, comes into his temple and cleanses it of abomination so that there might be salvation, so there might be healing, so that there might be true worship of God. So we're going to enter into the house of God today to find out what it means to worship God, to enter into his holy place for the house of the Lord to be a house of prayer. So let's begin with our text. Matthew chapter 21, starting at verse 12. As Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. So you have to understand that during this time, all male Jews were obligated to go to Jerusalem during Passover. But they didn't go just alone. They would go with their wife and children or families or extended families. Thus, a lot of people were being there. But there's three aspects I want to cover that will help you understand why Jesus was so upset with what was going on. And so those three things are selling animals for temple sacrifice, money changers, and the court of the Gentiles. So, you could bring your own animal for sacrifice to the temple. I mean, you were to bring an animal for sacrifice to the temple. But bringing an animal all the way on a long trip could become burdensome, uh, to say the least. But also, 
it might not be good enough, so to speak, for a sacrifice at the temple. So the merchants got together with the high priests, and the merchants bought animals, pigeons, so forth, that were acceptable to the priest. So they would buy, they'd take it from the priest, and then they would sell it to the people. They had a corner on the market, right? And not only did they make out well, money would then flow back to the priests. Quite the price gouging going on. And when there's a corner on the market, when people are being gouged, who suffers the most? The poor people. The faithful who came to the temple to offer a sacrifice. But because they were being gouged, what would cost maybe a few pennies, they then had to pay dollars. So that's the first thing. The other aspect that I want you to consider here is I want to layer in a little bit of sensory layer. Because, you know, Fountain Hills, right? When we have the art fair, we go from 24,000 to 100,000 people. And there's a lot of people, right? So it's noisy, there's music, people talking, laughing. There's also smells from the engines that might uh, run the generators, the food, all of that. Now, take that, though, and expand it even more back in Jesus' day. And so you would have all these people who have been traveling. There would be a lot of sound, a lot of bartering back and forth, maybe some body odor mixed with that. And then you had all of these animals besides. And all of the animals weren't necessarily clean, because if you ever worked in a barn, you know what a barn smells like. So you have all of this, okay? Now let's add in another layer. The money changers. So money changers would sit behind little tables covered with coins. One commentator put it this way. In the temple area, foreign money was not accepted in payment. But money was needed to fulfill the various rites of purification plus the temple tax. And it had to be paid Ultimately, it had to be converted into Jewish money because the foreign money, the pagan money, was not considered appropriate for the temple. So you had all of these people traveling from different lands who were coming here, including the foreigners, and they didn't have the proper money. So they would exchange their money. And of course, when you exchange money, money is made. So you had money being exchanged hands that way. And again, people were, it was ripe to, for scams to happen, for people, to, again, to be gouged. And now one last aspect here. All of this would have been take, taken place in what's called the court of the Gentiles. So the court of the Gentiles was the outer, it was the outermost part of the temple. And as the actual name suggests, this is where the non-Jews could be. So the foreigners, they wouldn't be clean to go into the temple, but they could be outside of the temple. So what Jesus saw was all of this. Put all of that together. Was this a house of worship? No, it was not. And he was incensed. Let's go back to our text. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Now, when Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, he's actually quoting Isaiah, our reading from Isaiah. And I'm actually just going to read verses 5 through 8. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. 
I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who joined them to the Lord to minister him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servant, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God, who gathers the outcast of Israel, declares, I will gather yet others to him, besides him, those already gathered. This is a beautiful, beautiful statement from God regarding his house. We find that outcasts are brought in, right? Foreigners are brought in. Salvation is there for all who come to him. And they're given an everlasting name. His house is a house that is holy. In his house, the name of the Lord is loved and revered. And the Lord will bring joy to those who enter into his house. His, his house is a true house of worship in which the Lord is revered and praised. This is what it is in Isaiah. This is what Jesus is referring to. It is a house of the glory of God. It's not just this temple. It is the house in which the glory of God reigns. Ezekiel, had, he had a vision of the temple of the Lord. And in Ezekiel chapter 43... Verses 1 through 9, there's this vision. I'm just going to read verses 4 through 7, because it's just beautiful. Actually, I'm going to read a little bit before that and then pick it up. As the glory of the Lord entered by the temple by the gate facing east, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. While the man was standing beside me, I heard one speaking to me out of the temple. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the people of Israel forever. You see, the temple is filled with the glory of the Lord. And it is a place where he will dwell in their midst. And you should really read Revelation too. And you get the fullness of the temple of the Lord and the glory and dwelling in his midst. You see, when we come to church here, when we come into the house of the Lord, we come to be renewed. We come to be cleansed. We come to be forgiven. And we receive all of those things coming into his house. And even this area that you're sitting in, this is called the sanctuary. It is a place that is to be sacred, to be holy, to be set apart from the rest of the world where you come into the presence of God. This is not a stage. This is an altar. And we come before the throne of God and we come into his glory. This is a sacred place. And when you come into the presence of God, the only thing that's there is worship and praise. You lift up your prayers with all of the other saints. This house is a house of prayer unto the Lord. But, but there's more to this than that. You see, Jesus says, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Now, when he's referring to Isaiah, it is the Lord God speaking. Yahweh, right? The Lord God says, it is my house, my house is to be a house of a prayer. But Jesus, the King, has just come in triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And now the King, the Son of God, comes into his house. 
And he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. When we enter here into the sanctuary, we come into the presence of God, into the presence of Jesus, His house. And His house shall be called a house of prayer. And this is for the outcasts, it is for the foreigners, it is for those who seek salvation, for all who call upon His name. This is but a bit of the glory of what it means to be in the house of the Lord. But Jesus saw something else. He saw that they were making it a den of robbers. And here, Jesus is quoting Jeremiah. So, from Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read the whole section here. But, and then I'll put up some slides when I get to it here. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all you men of Judah who enter the gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice with one another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place. In the land that I gave you of old to your fathers forever. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in the house which is called by my name? And say, we are delivered, only to go on doing all of these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers? In your eyes, behold, I have seen it, declares the Lord. So what you have here, if all of these hypocrites who are coming into the house of the Lord And they are doing abominable things in the eyes of the Lord. They're stealing, murder. They're worshiping pagan gods. There is no repentance. There is no worship in them. And they come and they are called then a den of robbers. You know, the the worst of the worst. But I got to thinking, den of robbers. What are they actually robbing? Because I think that's a good question to ask. What are they actually robbing? I mean, you can't rob from God, can you? You can't actually take anything from God. But you can rob yourself and others of the riches that God has to offer. You can rob yourself from the full relationship He offers you. You can reject his holiness. You can reject his love. You can reject his grace. And they were doing all of that in Jeremiah's day. They were doing all of that in Jesus' day. And they believed deceptive words. The Lord's temple, the Lord's temple, the Lord's temple. As if just going into the temple was worship. Like a check the box. Like, hey, I went to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. I'm good. I checked the box. I don't care about anything else the rest of the week. As long as I was in the building, that counts. Those are deceptive words. And you rob yourself and others with those words. You rob yourself of Grace, 
of love, compassion, the very mercy of God in Christ Jesus. And listen, you know what? It's really easy. It's really easy for us to make the Lord's house into something then less than the Lord's house. It's easy to take the Lord's house and make it less than the Lord's house. There's two, act- there's two ways we kind of do that. Here's the first. Legalism. Legalism is when a church says, you've got to follow all the rules, otherwise you're a sinner going to hell. Right? And people in a very legalistic church are fearful that they will be cast out. That if they break the rules even just a little bit, they'll be excommunicated, thrown out. That's one part. Now, there's another similar thing, in a way, to legalism, uh, but that's also ritual or doing worship with rote. You know, where things are just the same every single time and you just go through the motions. Both legalism and ritual or rote kill love. Worship becomes devoid of love, the love of God, and love for one another. So that's one way we make the house of the Lord less than the house of the Lord. The other way is actually just the opposite. It's a church in which anything goes. Sadly to say, there are way too many examples of this in our nation. And I'm going to give an example, an extended example, of what happened in one church on Super Bowl Sunday. It, uh, I'm going to be quoting from the Christian Post. This past Super Bowl Sunday, pastors with Crossroads Church in Cincinnati, a multi-site interdenominational church that boasts a weekly congregation of rough, roughly 34,000, punted a copy of the Bible as part of its Super Bowl preaching series. With Oh, there's more here. With play-by-play announcers, color commentary, a referee, and a stage covered in astroturf, the Crossroads pulpit resembled Allegiant Stadium more than any church on Sunday morning as senior pastor Brian Tome and pastor Allie Patterson sported football jerseys as they took the stage for the pregame flip. Patterson is then seen taking a few steps back as another pastor squares up the Bible, which had a football-style cover on it, before kicking the Bible off the stage into the crowd. In an introduction to the video, Andy Ryder, community pastor for Crossroads Anywhere, said, Today, you are tuning in for a church service that is unlike any other. Disclaimer, it has little to nothing to do with actual football or the Super Bowl, but no matter how you believe, you're going to laugh. No matter what you believe, you might be a little confused at some point, but I believe you will and can experience God and church in a fresh new way. You might be wondering why on earth we would do something like this. One of the reasons, he said, was because we believe that church can and should be fun. You're going to experience hilarious commercials filled with middle school humor really great music, and some good old-fashioned smack talk. But, he added, but secondly, we believe that there is a spiritual truth, truth and realities that can be drawn out from sports, and, that which is, and that's what each of our teachers are going to be doing today. Really? You're going to experience hilarious commercials filled with middle school humor. Do you remember middle school humor? I do. Really great music and some good old-fashioned smack talk. Boy, is that what you want in worship? Good old-fashioned smack talk, right? What they are doing is not worship. It does not revere God. They're treating people like children that need to be entertained. 
Where's the cross? Where's the gospel? Where is salvation proclaimed? It's not. They are robbing people. Outright robbing people when they do such things. But you might say, well, hold on, hold on. What about all the people who wouldn't come to church for something, you know, unless something like that happens? Well, as I talked about on last Wednesday night, I referenced R.C. Sproul, great theologian. He's now gone to glory. But he said, worship is for the sheep. It's the sheep who know him and come to worship him. Now, if a goat comes in while we're worshiping, that's fine. Any goat can come in, but we don't change our worship for the goats. It's for the sheep because we revere his name. His house is to be a house of prayer. So Jesus comes in, he sees all of this, and he cleanses the temple. And then something amazing happens. The Savior King heals. And the blind and lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared praise. So Jesus cleanses the temple, and the blind and lame are healed. The blind and lame, it was often thought that God was punishing them for their sins to be blind or to be lame. And they would have been the outcasts in society. He cleanses the temple, and just like it says in Isaiah, it is the outcasts who are brought in, the foreigners who are healed. Salvation has come to them through Christ Jesus. And so the children, they sing the praises of Jesus as was done on Palm Sunday. Hosanna to the Son of David. This was high, high praise. You see, Hosanna to the Son of David, it actually refers back to Psalm 118. It, it, Psalm 118 says, save us, we pray, O Lord, O Lord, we pray, give us success. Save us, Hosanna, save us. And it is save us to the Lord God. Again, this is the Lord in all capitals, Yahweh, the great I am. And you were to call upon the name of the Lord for salvation, and now the children are giving that praise to the great I am, to Jesus. And by quoting this psalm, he is really saying, uh, I'm sorry, he, he's, and, and so Jesus quotes Psalm 8. I'll read it here. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens out of the mouth of babies and infants. You have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Jesus quotes that, and he's saying that he is worthy of that praise, that he is the Messiah. He is the one who is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords, and he has come into his house. And when he is in his house, there's praise, there's prayer. There's healing, there's restoration, there's forgiveness of sin. So let me ask you, Joy Church, is this house the Lord's house? Are we a house in which we come to worship Jesus? 
that lifts high the cross? Are we a house in which we come to be cleansed, to be restored, to be forgiven, to have that new name proclaimed, redeemed, an everlasting name because Christ Jesus has given us that name. We are redeemed. Are we the house that worship God, God that reveres his holy name? Are we a house of prayer? Amen? Amen. What a great message for Palm Sunday. My house shall be a house of prayer. Thank you.